Madam uh, Esther, thank you for joining us. And I know Narok County is also within the haven of female genital mutilation. Um, Madam Esther, perhaps maybe we'd want to hear from you on what the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution is working on in light of implementing um, the Prohibition Act number 32 of 2011. So quite interesting is that um, while working for um, some certain, um, for the Kenya Police Service, um, when it comes to evidence collection and uh, of, of female genital mutilation in building a case, I came to the record to, to learn that the components or the elements of the law are quite interesting. We heard from Vanessa. Vanessa, thank you very much. Vanessa said that she was told she was it was done to her at the age of nine. Her parents were in her family was involved, her relatives were involved. And we've heard of the evolution of the cutter from Bonanyerera, where we're saying that this is a medic, there's medicalization. You walk into a hospital and it's done in Kisi and Nyamira. So within, in light of the implementation of the law and the dynamic that also just been shared um, in terms of the law and not having uh, um, it's coerced, would you maybe share with us what the ODPP is working on and help us understand this prohibition act? in terms of aiding and abetting, procuring, premises. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Maureen. As I said earlier, uh, our work is majorly on prosecution of uh, criminal cases. And as we all know that uh, female genital mutilation has been outlawed and uh, the uh, constitution and also the uh, prohibition of female genital mutilation act um, are the key legal frameworks that enable us to prosecute these cases in court. This um, act, the 2011 uh, Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation, there are various offenses under that act, starting from section 19 to 25 of that act. And here we usually charge the circumcisors be it those old women in the communities or even the medical pra practitioners, we are charging, the, uh, charging them under Section 19. There's also the offense of uh, aiding and abetting. For example, where the, uh, somebody knows that uh, that act is going on in a certain area and he was in a position, he or she was in a position to uh, let the uh, authorities know we usually, uh, we usually charge that person with aiding and abetting because they did not do anything about it. So uh, under Section 20, we usually uh, charge with aiding and abetting. There's also procuring. The circumcised girls themselves, we usually charge them, be it the, uh, but mostly the older women uh, above 18 years, we usually charge them with the, with the offense of procuring the female genital mutilation. There's also the offense of uh, allowing your premises to be used for FGM. Uh, we charge them also under Section uh, 22. There's also when you are found with the possession of uh, these tools or equi equipments for female genital mutilation, we charge them under Section 24 of the FGM Act. There's also uh, failure to report. For example, where parents are allowing their children to undergo this cut, and they did not tell the authorities. We will charge them with that, uh, with that section. And our case in point I have, that I've uh, done is where we had two sets of parents, uh, very old parents, past eight years, eight years, where uh, this young girl, she was below the age of 18, and she was uh, uh, made to undergo the FGM Act so that she can be married off. So her parents were charged with uh, uh, the issue of early marriage and also the parents of the alleged uh, husband were charged with aiding and abetting and also failing to report the, the offense. So failure to report is also an offense under section 24 of that act. There's also that uh, the offense of maybe uh, using abusive language uh, towards these people who have not undergone FGM, the girls that have not undergone FGM. We usually charge them under Section 225 of the Act. 
and the uh, penalties for these uh, offenses are very uh, stiff, very punitive. So we usually send a message to the community out there by um, prosecuting this uh, uh, a number of these cases and ensuring that we secure convictions so that we can send a message to the community. Maureen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yes. and thank you so much, Esther, for um, sharing that with us. I just want to ask, which is quite interesting, you have, um, the law looked at the, the crime of, the offense of FGM and yes. separated its offenses, isn't it? Where yes. you look at procuring, aiding and abetting, I can't yes. go around and call my sister, you've been, you've not been cut, you know, yes. giving derogatory cultural names. I want yes. to understand from your experience in Narok County, because I know the yes. ODPP has, I think, set up, I stand corrected, an office for handling FGM, isn't it? Yes, yes. Now, from your experience, what are the chances that my father will not take me out of this, uh, I'm using myself as an example, whisk me away? Because I've seen there's uh, extra territory, I think extrajudicial territorial, where I'm taken from where I am and maybe crossed over to another border, to another country, and it's done. What are the success rates? How is it? I know at times it can be overwhelming when you see a nine year old girl brought to you. What is the success rate of having the law actually um, take its full course? And also yes. with evidence collection. Yes, just tell us your experience. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you, uh, we have that uh, anti-FGM department in our office where we are usually taken through thorough training on this FGM uh, issue. And on the issue of evidence collection, I can say we usually, it is a prosecutor uh, uh, investigating officer uh, led investigation. Sometimes they bring these cases to our offices and you can see there are a lot of loopholes. So we do not charge immediately. We uh, take back the file with the areas to be covered by the investigating officer so that we can have watertight cases in this uh, in these matters in court. So that's what we usually do. We usually ensure that we have uh, watertight cases that go to court. The other thing that we usually do also uh, on the issue of cross-border or uh, these people try to uh, run away from the law or run away from the law enforcement, uh, law enforcers. We usually, for example, when you have a matter which has been brought to court, we take the evidence in the earliest opportunity possible. Uh, for example, if you have a young girl who has been circumcised, we usually uh, take them to uh, rescue centers where they stay for some time before they uh, give the evidence in court so that we can release them back to their, to their, um, to their families. In, uh, in order to avoid this, the issue of interference. Because you can imagine, I handled a case where a mother was being charged with uh, procuring this uh, FGM to the daughter. And you can imagine they're coming from the same home, uh, the same vehicle they're coming to court. The mother is the accused person. The daughter is now there, the complainant. You can imagine the challenges the drama that was in court. It was really dramatic. So what we usually do, we usually take them, we work hand in hand with the children office and we take them to the rescue centers. Then after they testify, we usually uh, uh, release them back to their to their families. So the success rate uh, at this point in Narok town is uh, very successful because the kind of cases we take to court are not just uh, shallow, shallow investigated uh, cases. They're usually high tech. We're usually trained very well on how to go about those cases. And I can tell you the cases that I've handled, we have secured convictions and we have sent messages to the, to the um, uh, communities back then. Mm. 